It looks like a lot of you are already tweeting, but in case you didn't get the memo, here are the hashtags that we're using. Feel free to tweet. Uh, and that's my handle on Twitter if you want to get in touch. My, as Tristan said, my name is Lisa Caddo. I'll be talking to you today about websites and how to think critically about what we're putting on websites and evaluating them. This project is my master's thesis at Portland State University. It's on the west coast of the US in Oregon. And it started out of, an, out of just wanting to do something with public archaeology. I wasn't sure what that was when I started grad school, but I just knew I wanted to do something with it. I have a background in digital communications. That's my current career, public relations and social media. So I knew in terms of public archaeology, I wanted to combine that with my background. And my advisor and I started just doing a lot of reading about public archaeology. And we learned three things. First of all, people love public archaeology. Secondly, people love websites. Third, and most importantly, I would say generally speaking, people aren't really evaluating and assessing either their public archaeology projects or their websites. So that's kind of where this project came to be. Originally, we thought, OK, I'll make a website for my master's project. It would be a website for my, advi my advisors involved with this big research project in the state of Washington. So I'll make a website for that project. And then we went to start looking in scholarship to see what defines a good website so we could use that as a basis. And we found that really isn't out there. There's not much information out there that guides someone on how to make a good archaeology website. This could be for a variety of reasons. Archaeologists are busy. We all know that. A lot of times public archaeology is on top of existing duties as an archaeologist. Sometimes I would imagine archaeologists aren't necessarily trained on making websites, how to make them, how to communicate via websites. And also, archaeologists may not always be trained in qualitative analysis, which would be at the core of a good website assessment. What we wanted to do with this project is to bring the standards of academic rigor to the idea of websites. So that's kind of where we started, which meant we needed to step back from the idea of making a website for my advisor's uh, research project and think about what makes a good website before we can actually make one. So that's how this project came about. Our ultimate goal is just a big one, to improve public archaeology, get people jazzed about archaeology, get people just more involved. And to do that, one way would be looking at websites. We wanted, as I mentioned, a project that's based in academic research while also providing useful tools that anyone could use to improve their public archaeology and communication. So that was really our main focus, is we wanted usable, applied, practical things. So we're going to make two tools. The big one is a handbook on how to make archaeology websites. So it will cover archaeology content and how to write about archaeology for the web, as well as just the general web functionality stuff of design, how to choose a service like WordPress or Wix, um, budget things. It'll just kind of be a one-stop shop to cover that type of information. The second tool is a rubric of sorts that directly talks about the archaeological content. And it could be used to either guide creating a website in terms of thinking about what you want to talk about for archaeology, or it could be used to evaluate an existing website if you have one to just really think about the content. But before we get there, we have to do some research. We can't just put these tools together without having an academic basis of what really does make a good website. That piece is being currently worked on and we're doing a website analysis. We need to look at what's working on archaeology websites, what's not working. Uh, we've decided to evaluate 10 archaeology websites. 
we'll be looking at two components. One is the actual archaeological content, and then the other component is the web functionality, which is, you know, the design and all that stuff. For our methods on um, this website an analysis, this is the portion that has to do with website functionality. It's basically the look and feel and usability of a website. And these are the pieces that are relevant to all websites. It doesn't just have to be about archaeology. We thought we can't just look at archaeology content. I mean, imagine a website that has great information about some archaeological project that you're really interested in. But as soon as you go to that website, it plays music and the background color is bright yellow and the text is hot pink. Are you going to want to stay there? Are you going to want to send your friends there? No, right? So we can't just talk about how to communicate archaeology well. We need to really be talking about the design and some of those pieces. So as you can see on here, these are some of the components that we'll be looking at as part of this website analysis. Uh, for example, under content and style, we'd be looking at how readable the text is, and I'll talk about how we do that in a little bit. Fortunately, there are a lot of resources out there that really establish best practices in website functionality, and that's been super helpful. But for someone who doesn't have a background in this, it can be really overwhelming trying to wade through all of the stuff out there talking about, you know, how what good design looks like and all of those pieces. As I mentioned earlier, there really isn't a lot of guidance out there for archaeological content. So whereas we've got a lot of resources for the website functionality, we're sort of struggling with the content side of things. I would imagine that if all of us in this room were asked to write down maybe the top five or ten take-home messages you would want someone to have about archaeology, they would be pretty similar. I think archaeologists have a few general things that we all agree upon that we want people to know. But we haven't necessarily rallied around those ideas. It's not like here's the list of the ten basic tenets of archaeology that we're always, always communicating we decided we needed something like that to form the basis of this website analysis for the content. We needed to be able to look at all of these, webs these 10 websites in terms of what kind of messages are they conveying. And we went to this book, my advisor and I lovingly call it the Bible, Oxford uh, Handbook of Public Archaeology. And Franklin and Moe have a chapter in there where they provide five themes for archaeological literacy and education. And we found that we think that these five themes would work really well for website analysis. So they, some of them are pretty self-explanatory, but it, it gets at ideas of stewardship or explaining to the public how we know what we know, what's the methodology, how can the non-archaeologist public interact with archaeologists and engage. So we thought these five themes were a really good start for evaluating the archaeological content of these websites. So we've got the two areas that we're looking at on these websites. We've got the website functionality, and then we've got the, the themes, archaeological content. So what websites are we actually doing? Da, 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 da. We divided them into four categories. First is media outlets. We've got Current World Archaeology Magazine and Archaeology Magazine. We've got research projects. We're doing Archaeology in Annapolis. Chocolat Project and West Point. We've got professional organizations, the Archaeological Institute of America and the Society for American Archaeology, EAA, you're off the hook for now. And for education, we've got Day of Archaeology, Project Archaeology, and the National Park Service's Public Benefits of Archaeology web pages. So those are the 10 sites that we're looking at. And we'll be evaluating each based on metrics we've established that fall under either the website functionality or the archaeological content and themes categories. We quickly learned through starting this analysis that we had to set up 
we came across a couple issues while setting up the protocol. So for this qualitative content analysis, I've created a protocol and I'm just kind of running through that with every page I'm, I'm assessing. But two issues came up pretty quickly. Some of these websites are huge. I'm sure you can imagine how large the website for Archaeology Magazine is because they're always putting out different articles, right? The other issue is the variation in size. Some of those websites are enormous and other ones are pretty small. So how do we proceed with that? For example, Current World Archaeology has nearly 2,000 pages, whereas the Chocola Project only has about 31. So that means the magazine's 62 times larger in terms of their website. So I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, sample size, what are they doing? So to control, for a comparable analysis for control, we had to look at scale differences. We, I can't study every page. I don't, I don't want to try. I don't have the time. It's too much. And this is a master's degree, so no, I don't have to do that. Um, but thinking about our primary goal, we want to see how websites are communicating with the public and how well that works. So with each of these websites, we thought we'll focus on those pages or sections that either are directly intended for a public, a non-archaeologist audience, or that non-archaeologists may be more likely to stumble across. For example, on the Society for American Archaeology, instead of doing their whole website, they've got a subsite for for the public, like a for the public page, so we're focusing on that. We'll be looking at 10 pages on each website, so a total of 100 pages, and if we come across any issues with them, we can just go back and add some more. I'll run through a little bit of what I'm actually looking at when I'm doing running through this protocol. So I'm going to get get a little mobile here. Uh, for, so this is an example for web functionality. So we'll use the SAA's for the public homepage as I'll just kind of give you a run through what I'm looking for. Uh, first thing I'll do is look at the navigation. So at the very top you've got the primary navigation these like, educational resources feature link, I call those secondary navigation. So I'll make note of all those. I make note of the headers and the subheads on a page. Uh, note down any multimedia, so any images, videos, what they're about, the text that goes along with them, what's being conveyed. I'll do a word count on all the pages and, and how much text is used. And then just jot down any of the topics that are covered. In terms of um, if you think back to the four areas of web, web functionality I showed, for content and style, I'll look at readability. And one of those metrics that we found are there, there's these readability services where you can plug a URL into it and it'll pull up all of these indices and tell you how that website ranks. For example, it'll tell you the age range that that website could, you know, could be easily understood, like what age group. So this one, has a seventh to eighth grade reading level, which is great because that means a lot of people could read that website. If it's a 12th grade reading level, you're already alienating a large audience, you know? Under layout and design, one of the things I look for is, is the website mobile friendly? This one's not. Not even a little bit. Um, it doesn't, you know, in a lot of things, it'll, websites, if they're responsive and mobile friendly, they'll rearrange themselves, you know, when you're shrinking on the screen. This one doesn't, so that's one issue. The text at the top is very concise, which is great, but then here you've got a really big text block that is kind of small on the page. I look at, under for navigation, I'll look at the main navigation, so you can see at the top, there's a resources tab, and there's also a links tab. And to me, that's kind of confusing. Of coming to the side, I, I don't didn't, quickly understand the differences between links and resources. And then accessibility, there's some legal frameworks out there as well as best practices that sort of outline how to make a website accessible. And just like the readability scores, there are also accessibility scores out there where it'll you could plug in a URL and it'll spit out coding issues and all sorts of problems that make your make a website um, unfriendly for extra services, like readers or someone with maybe a visual impairment might use some tools to help them, and some websites aren't very friendly for that. For example, this website, 
doesn't have any alt tags on the images. And if someone has a visual impairment and they're using a tool to have them read the text aloud, and then it gets to an image that doesn't have an alt tag, that's just blank information. You're missing out on an opportunity to tell them what's in that photo. And putting text in an alt tag lets you tell them what the photo's about. And in terms of the content analysis, I'll use this as an example to quickly tell you a couple things I look at for uh, the archaeological content in those five themes I mentioned. So let's use stewardship as an example. My first reaction to seeing this page, there's not much on here. How can it really convey a lot of messages? But you know what? This one do, does a darn good job of conveying some messages about stewardship with very little text. The first thing I look for is how extensive the theme is present. So I'll just try to read through it and see is stewardship present on that page and how is it present. Uh, for example, this one only has three sentences of body text. The entire second sentence is about stewardship, so I'd say that's pretty good. I look for how explicit a theme is used, and this is where kind of a qu quantitative content analysis comes in. I start counting keywords, so how often is the word stewardship used, preservation, heritage, some of those things. I look for, is the spirit of that theme embodied? So with stewardship, I'd say the, uh, the natural and sacred world of Chocolat at the bottom. I would say stewardship is, the spirit of that is embodied in that text of that link. And finally, I try to think about how a theme could be better used on a website. For this one, I think it's used pretty well, for, especially for a home page. You don't want all of your information on a home page. You want it to be kind of a starting point where people could go elsewhere. And I think this, this one does a good job of showing how people can get to other information. And just wanted to say, we're not advocating that all web pages and all websites use each of those five themes. What we're trying to suggest is we just need to think critically about the messages on our website and what we want to convey and how we want to convey it. And if we kind of rally around a few ideas, then I think we'll all, by working together, we'll be able to get those messages to the audiences that we're targeting a lot easier and will be more effective. So just a reminder, the next steps of this is once we finish the, the website analysis, we'll be working on the rubric to guide archaeological content, basically guiding you on how to goal set content for your site and then make the handbook. And hopefully within the next year or so, these pieces will be done because I got to graduate sometime, right? <laughs> And that's it. If you've got any concerns, ideas, questions, please contact me. I'd love to talk websites with you. And thank you to my thesis committee and session organizers.